Thanks, folks. It is 10.30. We are back from recess. My Conkey BES update and approved emergency operations plan, EOC, divisions and decision. Uh, good morning, commissioners, public. Uh, this first sheet I had handed out is the DES update. We have a uh, emergency operations plan, which is a basic plan, and then we have some annexes to that plan. And it needs to be updated, and the commission needs to reauthorize it. The basic plan basically has an overview of, of the emergency response organizations and policies that we have in the county. And then we have functional annexes. And those deal with specific things like direction, control, coordination, alert, warning, public information, communications, uh, multiple uh, casualties, and shelter in place, and then the hazard specific. We've identified, uh, uh, there's what, there's six different hazards specific for us. The plan is an all hazard plan that we can use, and uh, <coughs> Montana DES likes to have local governments to review and update their plans, you know, reauthorize them every four years, minimum four years. And so that's what we're going to discuss today. And I have prepared a resolution for the Board of County Commissioners and for the City of Town on the minutes. I'm on the agenda for the uh, City Council on the night of the 19th, okay. Tuesday after um, holiday. And do you have any questions for me on a specific plan? Did you see in there different places like, uh, oh, for instance, down there in the functional annexes, Emergency Operations Center, we bring we revised that uh, last year. What we do is basically the emergency operation, a local emergency planning committee meets once a month. And we always have a meet about two o'clock for a workshop, one hour workshop with members that want to attend. Then three o'clock we have our regular meeting. And usually during those workshops we deal with one of these revisions, one of these plans up here. Basically there's very little change other than we try to make the plan shorter, take out extra verbiage that's not needed. And then we try to clarify different roles, responsibilities, and different response agencies. Um, incidentally, this Wednesday night for emergency responders, we have a, a railroad emergency response training. That will be over the community room from 6 to 10. Fire, law enforcement, EMS, and city and county, and are all invited to do some training. Somebody there from the Montana Rail Link. Basically, what we'll do is we'll go over our hazard uh, hazmat plan. How would we respond as a local community during the first like 10, 12 hours for a major train wreck, for instance? This is going to uh, deal, our, our plan is a generic plan, no matter what kind of a transportation accident we have, like truck, load of gasoline, or propane, or rail, it's all the same. Doesn't make any difference. Procedures, safety procedures are the same. And we're going to talk about uh, evacuation procedures and what agencies, local agencies have responsibilities. So it's kind of an overview refresher class for the fire department, search and rescue, EMS, law enforcement. And we have been kind of working on that uh, agenda now for a couple weeks. Actually, it looks like it's coming together. Montana Rail Lake will be there at that time. And that's for emergency responders and elected officials. Any questions for me? No, not frankly. Anything from the audience? I have a question for Mike. Yeah. All right, Mike. Okay because we talked about it in the last week yes. on that um, evacuation. Yes. Right now, the commissioners have the authority to, to determine evacuation. And one of the things we talked about, and I talked with Sheriff Dutton, was his commissioners did a resolution where if he had first he has to evacuate, instead of trying to get a hold of all the commissioners, go evacuate. And they, they've done that. Um, so Mike and I were talking about maybe a resolution with you guys, instead of trying to track everybody down to say, hey, this is what's going on, um, just be able to have the authority to, to, to evacuate people on a, on, a, on a needed basis um, and just kind of simplify that process. So, especially because sometimes we don't have cell phone coverage or anything else, so um, I don't have a satellite phone either. So uh, <laughs> it doesn't do any good. But I didn't know if you'd worked on that at all, Mike. I have. I okay. sent an email to a Paul Spangler. Uh, Lewis Clark County DS coordinator and asked for a copy of that. And they have searched their records, can't find the official document. And we're going to address that issue uh, next legislative session. Okay. Now, the MACO meets in February. There's two days where Montana Disaster Emergency Services are going to talk about these issues. <coughs> right now, the state law says the 
the evacuation authority rests with the city of Townsend with the mayor, and, and, and the county governments it rests with the presiding officer, the chairman, and the county commissioners. What we have done in the past for wildland fires is just like, say, if they have an apartment building at 3 o'clock on a fire, the fire department and the sheriff's office will evacuate everybody in that building and get them out in safety. And we'll do the same thing like we have a hazmat incident or something. That'll be the first response. What we do then is I get a hold of a chairperson of the board of the county commission or the mayor from the city limits, let them know what we're doing, and then we prepare a formal document that they sign. It's the same thing we do with wildland fires when we want uh, Montana Department uh, DNRC to respond with a helicopter. That has to be a formal request from the commissioners. But what we do is get them on the phone, get the helicopter in the air, get them responding. I'll prepare the document, run around to the commissioners, poems that haven't signed that. And there is a little bit of delay. And Wynn's right, we need to make that process less cumbersome. We need to figure that out. And it's an issue with, with all the counties. Now, same way in Gallatin County, we're all struggling with that. The way we do it now is, is evacuate and then verify it later through the paperwork. And that's just the way Montana law is. But Wynn's right, we need to work on that issue. It may need to be addressed by the state of legislature. But in the meantime, I think it's a great idea. The most important thing on any response to emergency or anything is, <coughs> is life safety for the emergency responders and the general public. We don't want to make the problem any worse. And we're not going to take any risks to save some property if the property is already lost or somebody is already deceased. We're not going to run in there and risk some more people to get injured. So that's, just, that's just a policy. That's our, our, it's part of our emergency operations plan. That's our risk management policy. And all counties have a similar plan. The sheriff does, and the fire department does. These are volunteers of the fire department, the union and society. And if they have family and they want to go home to them. But we want to compound that by becoming part of the problem. Any more questions from the audience? Commissioner? All right. As far as these updates, we've been meeting, we've just done the uh, update of the. Uh, would you explain what we did with. Um, Daphne Dignardakis with Tetra Tech. Yes, <coughs> that was our, our pre disaster mitigation plan. And what we did is we looked at the different risks or hazards that might affect Broad Road County and we identified those. Some of those are natural, like, for instance, a dam failure, upstream <coughs> dam, or Clark Canyon Dam, or Madison Dam, that we'd eventually come down here and have probably about 24 or 30 hours later, we'd have a major flood. And one of those dams failed, there's so much water that would actually we have to evacuate the entire town. Water down on the head of me, and we're probably be 8, 10 feet deep. The other risks we have, like earthquakes, we have winter storms, and different things like that. And uh, so what we did is we went through and identified all those natural, as well as there's some man made things like an active shooter, for instance, that might be a, 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 a what do they call it, a cyber security problem. It could be uh, any type of thing. It could be even a public health emergency, like smallpox evacuation or something, or Ebola. And so we have all those issues covered in our plans. A lot of them are generic. We give the emergency responders, the incident management team, the command, like the sheriff and the fire chief, we give them authority to make those decisions on, on how to handle that in the best way possible. Keeping in mind, the most number one thing is human life, life safety. Second is, you know, property conservation, try to put the fire out or control it. And then on a big incident, like for instance the railroad or the Yellowstone pipeline, say ruptured when it goes under the, the uh, Missouri River down there by uh, Trident, then we would, they would be partners. It's their responsibility. And they would come in and, and integrate into our emergency operations center and also be integrated into the incident command system. They'd be part of that. We'd let the railroad handle the big problem. What we do is respond. We'd be there the first four, five, six hours to secure the area, evacuate people, treat injured people, seal the area off, close roads and stuff, and kind of stabilize the incident. But if it was a big, huge explosion or something, we'd just probably let that burn it out. Those are decisions we make with, along with the railroad, the incident commanders, you know, you know, by command, that would either be the fire chief with the sheriff. And then in our county, we have three fire jurisdictions. The city of Townsend has a fire jurisdiction. Down in Three Forks, from mile marker 101 or road 101 south, is within the Three Forks Rural Fire District. And the rest of our county is in the Broadwater County Rural Fire District. 
and those fire districts have jurisdictional authority, like on hazmat, anything that involves you know, hazardous materials. So this is not the same, but it's intertwined. It most certainly is. It's, not, it's one of our building blocks mm -hmm. to identify. What we did there with Daphne is we just, uh, that plan is up for public review. I think I had a legal notice in the paper. You can get a copy of it, that is a copy of it, I think, down at the uh, clerk recorder account. You can look at it. You can go online and uh, also look at it, have comments. We'll have a public comment until about the 1st of February. Basically, it looks at all the different types of threats and pre disaster mitigation. What the federal government wants us to do instead of, uh, just like the flooding down the Mississippi River, they want. Communities go on there and plan for emergencies, build dikes, build levees, and stuff like that. To get any federal money to do that pre mitigation stuff, you have to have one of these plans, uh, pre disaster mitigation plan, and you got to have one of these plans, emergency uh, operations. Uh, this is a good plan. I'd like to make it smaller, less paper, less, you know, more of a <coughs> type type thing. And we're going to be talking about that this, with the fire department and the MGs you know, and the sheriff's office. Training, how can we make our emergency response plan for uh, hazmat and like a rail line easier? And how can we make take out some stuff we don't need? Excellent. You have a big plan like this, nobody's ever going to read it other than myself, or perhaps fire chief and the sheriff. But it's, uh, it's what we got, and then it's time now to reauthorize it and move forward. I, I will say, Mary Alice, too, but I think she read the whole thing and offered all the edits. She sure has. <laughs> We're going to miss Mary Alice, but yeah. I will be a good mayor. Yeah, absolutely. So um, if it's okay with you, Franklin, what I would like to do, uh, since we need to advertise for two weeks to do a resolution, is do a pre-approval so that the city council knows that we are in favor of this and uh, then follow the process so that we have the law covered. Is that okay with you? Mm -hmm. All right. So for the record, um, let's go ahead and just have a pre-approval vote, and then that way Mike has that to take to the city council. I'll make a motion to <clears throat> uh, pre approval vote on this resolution as stated, I guess I say. I'm not going to repeat all the things you just said. Yeah, we get it condensed down to. All right, I'll second. I'm sorry? You get it condensed down, so it's just a motion, not a full page stuff. Yeah, I'll second the motion. It's been uh, moved and seconded to pre approve the joint resolution. Read promulgating the emergency operation plan. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye, motion carries. So this will be advertised for two weeks and then we'll have a full public hearing on it. Um, and basically what we're doing is just um, approving updates to the plan. So it's, it's just more managerial. So anything else from you, Mike? I don't just hope to see you Wednesday night. Yes. Community room library. Right. Thank you. And we'll be back next week. I think we have a uh, invitation for bids we're going to open. Yes. And uh, let me know when I meet with you in two weeks. Okay. We'll be back with Sounds answer good. Question. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Mike. Can I ask a question of Mike before he leaves? Yes. You have emergency operation plan. The acronym is EOC. What's the EOP? It's operation. EOC on this. It should be P, shouldn't it? That's correct. That's on my little handout. Or is that on the resolution? Yeah, it says EOC. EOP. Oh, it should be EOP, isn't it? That's correct. Okay. That's good. Correct. Just a typo. Man. Just a typo. Uh, we have a, another acronym. It's uh, ECC, Emergency Coordination Center. Right. And we would set that up out here at the fairgrounds for H Valley. And that's what we would. The reason we go out there is in case we have to evacuate the town. Mm -hmm. It's a uh, floodplain. Dam Bay or away from the, away from the railroad or the highway in case we have a you know hazmat you know, chlorine leak or something on the railroad, propane leak or something. Any other questions? Thank you for bringing that to my attention. Thanks, Thank you. Mike. Thank you. <coughs> All right, 1045, crisis intervention and da jail diversion grant decision. Um, what we applied for a crisis intervention and jail diversion grant. Oh gosh, about nine months ago with um, DPHHS, Department of Public Health and Human Services. This is a grant that helps us to pinpoint what our mental health issues are in specifically our detention center so that we can go to phase two with those answers and hopefully 
um, implement what we need to to most directly um, address the issues that we come up with. Right now we know there's problems, we know there's issues, we just don't know the specifics. We need to boil that down to some specifics so we have a foundation to move forward with. Um, so what we have is a grant, it will be led by law enforcement, uh, the county attorney's office, and uh, Mike Stevenson with the LAC, the local advisory council for mental health, has volunteered to also be a um, advisor and support for this, if not lead. So, um, any questions on this? Do, uh, we have law enforcement and Mike both here. Do you guys have any issues, questions, input? Is it is it just going to deal with? Is it just going to deal with the inmate population, or are we going to? Is, is part of that feasibility study going to be to look at the citizens? It really is your bus to drive when. Um, you could do both, I would think, and, and mind your expertise too, it would be invaluable, but um, there's no reason that you can't actually have somebody look at not only your population, but also preventative, the people not yet there that might be on that road there. So I would think both would be valuable. Well, and, and, and talk with Commissioner Slifka just here a few minutes ago, <coughs> part, of, part of that and I, and I talked with Mike about this as well, is right now our, our, our local inmate population is very minimal. However, I, look, I like to look down the road a few years to see what it's going to look like you know, in a different setting. Our crime is obviously not going away, and so our, eventually our inmate population is going to be higher where we have the ability to maneuver some diversion, uh, whether it be through mental health or, or some co-occurring chemical dependency work for one scram or <coughs> sober link or something of that nature. Right now, most of our inmate population is DOC, which we can't do anything with. But um, my one of my big concerns and one of my th things that I voice the most is, is we need somewhere pre-crisis for the folks that are struggling in the community. And, and that's where I really like to see a lot of effort. We just, we had a a situation this week where we had a gal get very violent and she ended up in handicaps in the back seat of a car, taken to St. Pete's, and then when it was time to take her to her hearing, she refused to leave the hospital, so it took five sworn officers dragging her out of the hospital, kicking and screaming, and then she refused to get out of the van. So the judge had to go down into the Sally Port in Helena and conduct the hearing there. I would like to have something these guys and gals can go to prior to that event happening. Um, that's just, it's not fair to them. I mean, it really isn't. It's pretty humiliating to, to have a mental health crisis that you can't control in the first place and then end up in the back of a patrol car getting drugged around by, by law enforcement. And so I, I'd like to, you know, if they're gonna do a feasibility study, I'd like to make sure that's encompassed. Is a community, uh, I don't know, some sort of community crisis center, walk-in center or something that Folks that will reach out before they have a problem, um, and before we have to get involved. So I, I didn't know if that part of that grant. I was trying to read everything, and, and some of it's a template, and it's kind of canned form. But um, I was just trying to. I, I, I kind of wanted to find our ideas of where where the where the ship was going. So. The the grant is really open for you to drive the ship. So, um, yeah, I, I agree with everything you're saying. The thing is, is we know this, but we've got to have the documentation that comes from a study, yeah. that comes from somebody who's unbiased, as you've been saying, Mike. Um, it has to have a scientific and evidence-based foundation. So how do we get there so that we can get to the next step? Yeah. But yeah, you're not wrong. Yeah. Um, I mean, and we do. I mean, in, in discussion with Mike, I mean, probably 8% of our our MA population has some sort of mental health issue. Um, and a lot of them have that co-occurring chemical dependency to go with it. That's just, that's just life. <clears throat> so, um, you know, there's, like I think I said last meeting, there's quite a, a, a vast group of folks that fall under that umbrella um, that, that need services of some nature. And we just gotta figure out a way to do it and what's best for them. So, um, yeah, we can hopefully get get the ship on the right direction. So, but I'm in favor for a study to see what our needs are. 
Um, I think we need to do that. So. All right. And I'm Mike Stevenson, <coughs> the chairman of the local advisory council for mental health for Broadwater County. Uh, Central Service Area Authority, which is the group that's above us and kind of our parent group, has requested at the end of this month that we come up with uh, kind of a list of priorities, listing basic and essential needs, what's missing, what are the gaps in the community, listing services currently available, listing services that are lacking or need improvement, listing any new grants the community's received. Um, wondering if the community's done a needs assessment, wondering if we have a community health improvement plan, listing our, our top three to five priorities to meet local needs plus the top three to five priorities to address statewide needs. And it's been really helpful talking to Wynn. Uh, it's obvious one of the things we need on more statewide level is more emergency service support. And we just really are have very little here. Um, anyway, hopefully with this grant, I would like to see a more holistic picture of the county to get an idea of what all the needs are, as long as we're doing a, if we're gonna do a study. And then what from this study, we can tailor things to help you know, meet the needs in the jail, meet the needs of incarcerated people. I think another thing that's going to be important in all this is taking a look at, uh, you know, we have very little services here. And I really feel sorry for the sheriff, you know, there's no way to do an assessment of someone. You have to take them to Helena, which probably is going to take one or two officers, you know, remove them from their line of duty, it's really clumsy right now. I think they've done an excellent job in getting people help here. So I think there's a lot to look at. I did send to all of you uh, that survey that came out that was done by the state looking at how many mentally ill people we have in the county, what the different problems are. I got that from Kenny Bell with uh, the working for the state. And it is something I think we can pursue. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. All right, uh, we're talking about the jail diversion grant. So, any other comments or questions from anyone? All right, so what I'm hearing is support from both of you guys on following through with the grant. All right. Um, Anything further from you, Franklin, for the questions or comments? No, I mean, pretty much, between him and Mike pretty much stated everything. All right. What say you? Well, let me go ahead and follow up on this. I forgot how we're here. Jail. Crisis intervention, jail diversion, grant. So what we're doing is making a decision to adopt it to give law enforcement and the county attorney's office the authority to move ahead uh, in a manner that they determine works best for them. Right. So what we need is the motion uh, to that effect so we can go ahead and, and have that done for the public record. Well, I would like to the motion and I guess amendment to it stating that the county attorney and the sheriff and the law enforcement will take care of them. That basically right way to move. Okay, so I will second that motion. The motion has been made to go ahead and approve the Crisis Intervention and Jail Diversion Grant uh, for, uh, with EPHHS for Broadwater County. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye, motion carries.
Hey, Wynn, for the contact on this, would you like it to be you? Would that work, or do you want it to be Corey? I'll probably ask Corey first. I can put you both. Want yeah, to do that? Just, just put us both. Okay, I'll do that. Um, so, <clears throat> we'll go on. All right, we're at 11 o'clock. Thank you. Um, conference call. Um, it's not going to be a conference call. We have Garrett coming, so I'd like to wait for him to get here. Um, that's going to be uh, DISD, ITSD, I understand they're sick. Yeah. Uh, county Attorney's Office, a request to switch email server with county IT to the state system decision. So as soon as Garrett comes in, we'll go ahead and, and get started. Okay. Do you guys want to move up to the table? Get up um, go ahead. And what we'll do, uh, oh, due to public demand, you can have the mic. We'll give that to uh, let you and Garrett share, and then Franklin and I'll share this one. So if you want to come here. And I have your paperwork from last week. Do you have that same? All right. Sure. You mentioned that the public health service nurse is now permanent. At the last meeting, it was only, the last I remember, it was only A to Z temporary. <coughs> so, mm -hmm. a, a temporary. When was the decision made to hire this person permanently? Hi, Garrett. She's not a permanent employee, but she will be there indefinitely until we have one. Garrett, come on up to the table. How about right next to Brooke, and that one you guys can share the night. microphones are going to get here. All right. So we've already introduced the topic, and basically, um, we're just going to open it up for you guys uh, to educate us on what the, uh, maybe reiterate some of the history and then also uh, share your expertise about what we can do, um, what the issues are, and maybe how we can solve some of those. So, um, how, who wants to go first? I guess, one? I mean, my, my issue is just bottom line, we want to go back. It's really not a matter of what DIS can do. We can't do crisis studies on the back of that. Can you speak up, please? Sure. Use the microphone. Okay. Um, basically, um, what I said is that bottom line is we want to go back to the state system. Um, I'm not. There's a lot of things that have happened that we don't want to keep the same thing in place. Um, that's why I wanted to wait, and because unfortunately the people who are with the state um, were supposed to be out here today, but both of them fell ill this morning, so they couldn't be here. Uh, so I really don't have, other than what I've already told you guys, of why we want to. Um, I don't really foresee fixes that we necessarily want. We want to just go back to the state system. Am I right, Wendy? Yeah, I mean, there were a lot of reasons that compelled us to go want to go back to the state system. We've lost a lot of time in terms of man hours, in terms of calendaring. We have attempted to already address those through DIS. That resolution has been unsuccessful, which has compelled us to go back and say, hey, can we go back to the state system, which is where we're at now. All right, Garrett, I think I'll give you the floor. All right. <clears throat> well, I'm Garrett, I'm with the IS Technologies, I'm the IT Services Manager. We started working with the county in April of 2014. Um, at that time, we were hired on to do the IT Services Forum. And a lot transpired between that date and when we actually did these implementations. The one thing I'd like to point out is that the reason that all of the email was migrated in the first place wasn't just cost. Now, the decision was made to move to the email with the previous county attorney and all the department heads at that time in April of 2014. Um, there was emails going back and forth to why they wanted to move, but the majority of them was is that with the state system, they were paying more money, but they were also only able to store a gigabyte worth of data, email, and that's on the more expensive package. The cheaper package was about 250 to 500 megabytes. 
which if anybody knows modern email, that's not much space at all. So the decision was made partially for that. The other thing, the reason the attorney's office wanted to move was the case management system that was in place at that time. We probably remember some of those conversations, but. I wasn't a part of it. Oh, you weren't there? Okay. I've been Actually, there Actually, none of the office staff was years, a part of those conversations no. with the previous county okay. attorney. Okay, so the previous county attorney, let me give you a little history on this. They had a case management system, which for people that may not know, what that is is how the attorneys keep track of the caseload that they have what's going on with it, notes, anything like that. And we I don't even have that. It got deleted right It after. was actually American Prosecutor. It didn't get deleted. It got suspended because it was taking too much of our server space. It was not a good fit for our office to begin with. Okay. However, we no longer use it, and it's not the only means that we have to keep track of our files. Obviously, the vast majority of attorneys nationwide do not use a paperless system, which was Carla's ultimate goal. Um, it's not that we don't want to eventually keep up with technology, it's that it doesn't suit our office needs. Okay. So. And so anyway, what, what part of that software was supposed to do is email out statuses or whatever else, calendaring events, whatever it may be, and the state of Montana would not integrate that in with their system. So that's how we got introduced into this whole thing to begin with. Let me also make one very, very point in fact from a business standpoint. I make no money off of 365, which is what you guys are on email. So if, if you think I'm here trying to save any type of profit margin, it would actually be better for me to move you off of it in terms of a business because it takes more time for us to bill it all out, put it on our credit cards, and then charge you guys than it does to wash my hands of it and just have it all go to the state. The reason I'm fighting for it is because everybody else in the county loves that system because it stores so much more messages our help desk went down considerably just from April until when we implemented last year. And the reason it took so long to implement was because of the pending litigation against the county. So I made the choice at that point that I didn't want to move messages where they could be called back into needing them for evidence for a pending litigation. So <clears throat> that all being said, I mean, the cost isn't just with the email, though. Because in order to go back, you have to move back onto SummitNet. And as you remember, I was sitting right here in the seat not that long ago with the sheriff's office talking about the increase in cost that some of that was going to cost. That was the other reason that we moved off of it was for the internet connection side of it. So there's a lot of things that come into play. And you can't just simply take their three email addresses or four email addresses and put them back onto the state system. Not use their same existing email because in order to use the co.broadwater.mt.us, you have to move every email address of that over. Oh, we're, we're aware of that. We've okay. had multiple calendaring issues. Problematic because of that. Right. And yeah. the, the, the calendaring started because the state of Montana's email system did not allow to have complete control over the other person's calendar. I actually had, email. just so you know, Derek, I had literally no calendaring issues with the state system. C correct. Just, just so you know. I correct. Mean, so my issues didn't begin until the IS got involved. Okay. And our, our email addresses isn't my concern. I don't care about my email addresses. The other agencies that we are unable to get in touch with, which is multiple, I mean hundreds of email addresses that we no longer have access to, is my problem. You do have access I to do not. them. You can send email to them. If we have we their email address. address. And, and Garrett, if I, could, if I could literally take an inventory of the amount of my day that's taken up calling other agencies, convincing them that I'm from a county attorney's office so that I can get somebody's private email address who is on an employee state address system, I would love to bill you for that, but I can't. And it doesn't make my life any easier. DIS has not made our office any easier, and at the end of the day, we're not here to try to resolve things. We're just asking to go back to the state system. And while I appreciate your perspective, the state employees that have talked to us about it aren't here to defend that. Right. So it's really just you telling me about DIS. No, I'm not telling you. I'm telling you the history of why the choices were made. Yeah, and I, I will say, I mean, that I'm in my 16th year, and not one conversation was brought to me about us switching over because I would have said something about it. Because out of, I don't know about, I mean, I can say for the sheriff's office and a few other people, I deal with multiple agencies. And, I, and here I can give you a list. This is, and there could be hundreds of people with probation and parole and so forth, DFS on down the line that I don't have access to anymore because it really does affect my my job. And then when I'm calling people, I mean, it, if I have the cost down, it's $51.73 more a month, but I don't, I could, we could 
fill that out in about two days. Sure. To track and that's and that again, that's just email. You, you, no. It, what I'm trying to say is that there's more than just the county attorney's well, office there. that we chose for this. Yeah, I, I realize that, and I can't speak for other agencies in the county, but I can tell you that I've had a couple uh, reach out to me to find out how this meeting was going to go or how the past one, past the last one went because they're not happy. I, I'm just, I'm, and I'm not going to speak for them, but um, you made the statement that everyone else is happy, and I don't think that's a true statement. Um, this is the STSD um, benefits. I know. So I, I've, I've seen okay, that. So I've seen that. What, but the other part of that, what ITSD is doing is providing firewall and all that. You're already getting all of that as well. I know. We, we're not concerned about what we're getting right now. We just want to move back because mostly because of access to other agencies that we need access to. That's the end of the day. That's what we want for that reason. We're not... I mean, we could, we could get into a huge argument about what you provided, haven't provided, what we're not happy with. I, it really doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is getting in touch with these people. And some of these people, on the other hand, too, when they've sent emails to us, and these, understand these are, I know everybody in, in the county have critical things. We have very critical things. When I'm dealing with a kid that just got removed from, from somebody or something like that, we're talking every hour matters, and they're emailing me, and if they're emailing me on the old one, it gets kicked back to them, and we're playing the... Do you want to know the technical reason no, why? No, I don't. I really don't. I just want it fixed. Well, I can't fix it. It's on the state's hand as well. Exactly. Saying. That's why I, we want to be uh, back at the state. I think we do need to, to hear from both sides. Can you share the technical yeah. so that we have some... Basically, the way the email system routes is you have a list of domain names that's on your server. So when you guys were on the state server, co.broadwater.mt.us resided on the state email server. Okay. So when we went and changed it over to a hosted third party to do these other features, internally on the state side, that didn't change. They did not change their routing records. And we had many service tickets then calling and requesting. Many times they said, yeah, it's fixed. And then we hear that it's not. But ultimately what it comes down to is I have no control over what they do internally. And they're right. All these other agencies are still on the state email server. So those other agencies see the internal routing still being done which then turns into an undeliverable to the end u to their users because it can't find it on the state server because it doesn't exist anymore. The state shut down the e email addresses but not the routing. So this is a bigger problem, but one that I cannot fix. I've been in contact with the state to try to get a result, but they can't fix it. So now I'm being blamed for my system. Well, oh, I'm not and, saying that. We, we understand. I, I understand that part. I understand that there, it, it, that's an internal thing, but it wouldn't be an internal thing if I was on the state server. That's correct. They would not. They would not have routed wrong if we wouldn't have moved off of that. So but, all of the calendaring that we did, a whole host of emails, we didn't know we didn't even get until people started to say, "Hey, three weeks, two weeks ago, I sent an email, never got a response," and we're saying, "Well, we never received that," and and it just became a huge problem. And it's a problem. It yeah, and it still is. So what can we do to work with the state to get them to fix this issue so that you guys aren't losing emails? Yes. I've exhausted all my technical things that I've, I've emailed Jeremy. Jeremy, I've, I know Jeremy. Mm -hmm. Him and I've sat across the table many times and doing various things, but there's nothing that can be done. I have no control over the IT side on there. So right now what's happening is there's two options that I see. One of them, we stay where it's at and we try to get them to force out the email so everything works the same. That's not going to resolve their address book. I will say the other counties we represent, we do county attorneys, and that has never been a problem. I told Corey that when he called me. And you know, once we started to talk to other agencies, they, they have actually said, yeah, you know, it's a hassle. It's a hassle to call every, every department. It's a hassle to try to track people down. We have one address book that they copied when you guys, when they transferred over to DIS, but it doesn't keep a, a running update it with the address book for employees who come and go. That's so if we have a department that we work with a lot, like CPS, or like adult probation and parole, and there's a high turnover rate in that department, I, we don't have access to those email addresses unless and until we call somebody's secretary who may or may not be in, who may or may not know us, who may or may not feel like they want to give us an email address for somebody who, if we were a state employee, we should have access to from their perspective, which makes sense from their perspective because they are a state employee and have access to that address book. But you, but in and and case, I, we all understand why it's happening. It's just. It doesn't take away from the amount of time that we have to go through trying to do that so that I can send an email. And I've, I've never denied any of that. You know, the, the whole the whole thing that came up was after we did the migration. Again, it was 
you know as well as I do, we had that delay, and that caused, I think, more problems than if it would have been implemented when it was all decided by the department heads. Obviously, then the system would have been in place before anybody that's there now started, and that could have been status quo type of deal. All I'm, all I'm here to do is represent the county and the commission and the staff members that I have, that I've talked to, that I have talked about 365 and state. From my standpoint, as I said before, if you guys choose to move off of it, it has to be, unless they change their email addresses, it has to be a county-wide decision. <coughs> if they change their email address, then it doesn't. Now, I will caution you one thing on that. If you have a centralized uniform communications and they move to a different domain name, that is a co completely separate county identity. If you're fine with that and not having everybody under the control of one email domain, branding is what I refer to it as the public sector, or a private sector, in this case it doesn't, I mean, it, it doesn't matter. I'm just putting that out there as a warning. I'm not trying to talk you out Well, and it should be kind of irrelevant because we've always maintained our own separate server in our office. And, I mean, up until you guys took over, we, we also maintained our own internet contract with Morris and Merritt. And we yeah. had, yeah. and, and district card presses put their own separate, they're with the state. They, yeah, right, they're, <coughs> they're But they're supporters of the state as well. Sure. So, yeah. And actually, Carla was the first one that signed up with us to do all the work. So and then the rest of the county came on after that. That's how we came about doing our support. And the reason why is that the server well, at that time needed to be replaced for that other application because you're right, it was taxing it beyond, beyond control. So that part of it is the history of how we even got involved with this. Now, I'm fine with doing whatever the commission tells me to do, but right now I know I have service tickets held up because we're not getting calls from the attorney's office. So there's definitely a of bad blood between them and us or something. Because I have a service ticket trying to get Black Mountain, which is your guys' accounting software, and we can't even get a call back on that. So we have Josh call every month, try to check in and make sure there's nothing we, needs, we need to do and we're not getting calls back on that. I don't even know what Black Mountain is. It's yeah. their accounting software. It's supposed to be an enforced computer. Yeah, that would not be a hard decision. decision. Yeah. <laughs> well, Brooke, for my understanding, last week did you, you said, we agreed to just let you go back to the state. It's as yeah. simple as flipping a switch. Is that? It, according to Jeremy, it's, it's easy. From the state's side, yes. But again, they're not here right now to say exactly how that happens. But my understanding is fairly easy. It has to be fairly easy. When we switched over to this one, it was easier than I would have liked. <laughs> so It is as easy as flipping a switch if the entire county goes. If it does not go, then it's not as easy as flipping a switch. I'm a technical guy. I'm not a sales guy. I'll tell you that. From a technical standpoint, it doesn't work that way. You're either all or nothing on flipping the email domain. Yeah, and I understand that's the email domain. We'll, yeah. that's, we'll figure that out. I've moved from the clerk of court's office to the county attorney's office, and they've had to switch things because I wasn't, did, wasn't allowed access through their full court system. It's, I don't know. I mean, I know that it, it's not necessarily flipping a switch, but it, I don't think it's that difficult. And we're, we're, we're happy to change our email addresses yeah, and do whatever we need to do to get this resolved. The state has been very willing to work with us to do that. A couple of <coughs> questions on that. Um, you had mentioned liability and IT services. Can you address that? If, First of all, on the premise that we just moved the county attorney's office back to the state, what are some of the things that we need to be aware of? Well, what we need Corey actually would be the one to talk to on that from the litigation standpoint. But essentially what has always been key to us when we've done these migrations in the past is if you have two separate email systems, you then have to basically subpoena two or do research on two different e-discoveries of emails being done. So the whole reason of kind of doing the centralized IT, doing centralized email and all that was to make it easier on the county to provide information. And then if it was subpoenaed to be able to to do the research and get that information that's there. One of the things that was happening, and the reasons, and the people that I've spoke to in the other departments that like the large email capacity, they were having to delete email messages in order to keep the state keeping their email flow. Because once you hit a certain limit, they were basically shut off from the email system. So then what was happening was emails were either getting archived, or most of the time they're getting deleted. And in today's society, I mean, it's not hard to see any news article of government officials know being questioned of where emails are at and that's all I'm putting out there as a cautionary I'm not an attorney Corey would be your best bet to talk to on that 
but there is some concerns that should be addressed before that decision is made. That had to be addressed though before, right? When we switched to this system though. But anything. again, we moved it as a whole, right. and then that was all done, like I said, beforehand, before anything, I mean, it, it happened all before you guys' time, is what's, was what I'm no, saying. No, I was here, but it just wasn't okay. killed. Well, that, that's all I'm saying, is that the department heads chose on that as a whole. I have, you know, and it, it's not, my responsibility is to meet with the commission and be the department head's liaison. I don't have to talk to every single employee at the courthouse and also the troubleshooting problem that I'm working on. So I don't know how it was decided amongst the department heads and the commission to move that way. One thing I know is I had the order to do it. Yeah, and, and we did have a lot of meetings with the department heads, and of course it was their responsibility to talk to staff. I don't know what happened there, but, um, so when we switched, I think my question is not so much when we switched over and, and the possibility of switching back, but um, I think what you answered is if, if their email is on the state system, their county department, unlike Justice of the Peace and Clerk of Court, which are state departments, if this county department, just this one, has their email with the state, are there additional liability or IT support concerns we need to be aware of? I can't get the information that's requested as quickly if it's through the state. They do not communicate as, as smoothly as I would like, which is why we're running into the delivery of emails and all that. And there are tons of emails and the ITSD is acknowledge that and they're actually, which is the state, they're actually changing structure, trying to make things smoother. But what, at the end of the day, what it has come to us and supporting our, our clients, not just Broadwater County, is that there's always delayed. I cannot get the information or I cannot complete the task at hand as quickly because it has to go through a third party. What information, like, I guess I'm curious, what information are you talking about that you can't get? To Anything like, it? let's take for example, if you wanted to do um, any type of like backup or something like that where you have to open up firewall ports through some of that and things like that. There's tickets that sure. are created and they get back to you in about a week if you're lucky and possibly longer. Well and I know I know when we were on the state system before, whenever we had an issue with that, whether it was with our email being full or having an issue archiving things because I can promise you we have a liability working in the county attorney's office individually to maintain our records and to maintain our, our files, whether they're paper or electronic. So we don't delete things. Right. Um, so we do archive them. But whenever I've, so what, what typically would happen from our end is if I have an issue with my computer that, that revolves around email, I would call up the state system. They would give me a number right away saying, hey, here's your problem number. Um, we'll get back to you within 24 to 48 hours. And I, I just never had an issue having them return my call or if I needed to call them because my password was old or something like that. You know, they've always been very good about it. And so I guess my question is, above and beyond you guys maintaining something in our office, if it's hardware um, or what it is, because going back over to the state system, most of that would go through the state and most of that would be on us. Because when there's a problem, we're the ones who call. We're the ones who know about it. And I think the state needs to be here to speak to these things. We're making assumptions of things. I agree, but I know what the state supports under the state system. They do support the internet connection in your email. Right. So whenever there's a computer problem, though, sure. yeah. they and will support that. And, and before we that. even had, I mean, I can say working with the county attorneys so long before, we, but even before Morrison Merrily, we had um, a guy named Scott Davis, who right. was a friend of John Flynn's, would come in and do the work and we do contract work. And that honestly would happen like once every two years, three years. It was very, so that's what we have to do is look for outside. <coughs> that's but that's what I'm saying, we wouldn't have to look outside of it. Well, we don't need it very often, it's my point. And, and I mean, plain, if, if it's having all of these emails and, and access versus having to hire somebody in like two or three years to help us. <coughs> That's emails. where we're not communicating. It's not an either or deal. Just because you go with the state doesn't mean they have to lose the support. I assume you of the rest of it. talk with Corey and he's yeah. well aware and he's supporting. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I'm yeah. sure he wants you. So. But that's what I'm saying because I, I was brought here to explain the technical side of what happens mm -hmm. if they moved over there. Mm -hmm. Under no way was I thinking that if they moved to the state, they're going to be completely off our system. I figured we'd still be doing the backup support. We'd still be 
making sure that everything's getting patched, that all compliance was being followed, all that stuff would happen because that is above and beyond what the state does. Okay. So that was what my understanding was on this. I thought we were just trying to talk from a county wide of what is best to do with this particular office. If they want to go on the state, that's fine. I support the other agencies that are on the state of Montana's internet connection. I'm fine with that. I'm fine with the email side of it. I'm just trying to point out the possible pitfalls that would run into place. Because there's been times that I do not get the fast response, and it's not email. It's usually level two support stuff, switches not working right, routers not working right, trying to get firewall exceptions, things like that. Things that are above the main help desk level that goes into networking. And that's where I run into the problems. The normal help desk stuff, calling my emails locked out, it's full, need a password change, that's not a big deal at all. That's usually very quick. Never a problem. Okay, so this is doable with liability as long as we have... It's, it, as long as it's county policy. The only thing I'm saying is I'm not an attorney, but you should probably check to see either writing the policy or making sure that it's okay to do that. And I would check with liability carriers and that kind of stuff as well as a county attorney. But from what I've seen in the past, as long as it's written policy, you can do whatever you really want to do. But to sit there and try to... What I'm trying to prevent why I'm here is I don't want any regression back to where we were, a waste of taxpayer dollars to migrate an entire county back to where it was at so we could have a state address book. No, and, and I, I think we have to only talk about this department because I have not heard any complaints from anybody. In fact, the only thing I've heard is people are very happy with this new system because of the lack of space. Um, it is a liability for us to be deleting emails um, help with archiving was was tough to get. Some of us did finally, um, but we also had a computer crash. Um, what, 2012. That's not okay. We lost a bunch of budgeting for a whole year because we didn't have that that backup. Um, so you know, for us, we have to look at the whole picture. But if we can look at just this one department, and I think we need to make sure that we have protections for any of these pitfalls. We need to jump into the swimming pool and we know there's water in it, uh, not after we jump in, discover there isn't. Um, so we need to make sure that we're methodical and we do this step by step. Um, so this helps, it might be a possibility that we can do this. But Mer Morris and Merrily keeps coming up. Um, they're a good company, I have nothing against them, but they were extremely expensive, which was yeah. one of the other reasons that we looked at um, DIS. We also were one of the only counties in the state without cyber liability protection, without IT services. And we did have volunteers coming in, but you cannot have volunteers coming in to offer IT services for a county. We were lucky. We dodged a couple of balls there, but in today's day and age, you can't shoot from the hip with a wing and a prayer anymore, so we have well, to have to, IT services. To address those concerns, Laura, <coughs> just so you know, um, the, the Montana State Legislature is, is imposing actual guidelines for county attorneys <coughs> that will eventually have to get followed in regard to our electronic mail system and our internet system just because private, private attorneys have a whole protocol they have to maintain for their files. The state is going to that as well. Last year, last summer, they actually emailed me the book of regulations before it's been passed so that I could look at it. Um, and it was about the time of the transition, actually, because we wanted to make sure that we fell within those guidelines. Um, that's the main part of our liability, but again, because we've always maintained a separate school, <coughs> we've always maintained our own separate backups in our office. And so we, we kind of have had a higher standard just because of that and because of the amount of confidential information we have in our office, especially when Carla was looking at going over to a paperless office, that is a lot of confidential information electronically that we did not want anybody to be able to access outside of our office. And so we are actually in a really good position as far as that goes, as far as the liability goes, and as far as meeting those state standards. Um, our main concern, looking at those standards moving forward when it does become legislation that all county attorney offices have to maintain those, is really just our server space. And, and that's not a discussion that we're having here, so. It, I've seen the legislation too, it's a lot of the same long lines of law enforcement. That's what we spent all the time and money doing for your sheriff's office, was making them be in compliance so they could run siege and increase and things like that. Right. So, but their backups and stuff, we're actually managing right now. The 
as part now of our are. services. Yeah. And we have been since Carla brought us on, and Carla did bring us on before the rest of the uh, county did. We started providing support for Carla in March, and I think you guys came on in May, if I'm not mistaken. So there was a couple months there, and since that time, we've actually been doing all their support, their backups, their patching, all that's been being done through us. Okay. So, I mean, I am well aware of what's out there. I am also well aware of what the email system, either way, well, right now the state is, is in the trend, they're in the progress. They're actually talking about moving some of the state email departments over to 365, which is what you guys were on right now. So they're actually talking about that at the state level. Okay. I don't know what has happened since then, but I know that when we went to initially talk about this in 2014, a lot of what needed to be done in order to do the security side and things like that, make it integrate with that case management, was not being able to be possible at the state, and that's why it's moved. But they, I know the state is changing their infrastructure. They always are. I mean, as hacks happen, as things happen, as practices change, they're out there doing it. So I'm not going to talk bad about the state because there's nothing to talk bad about. They have a wonderful system, and I'm not going to argue that. It's just a matter of what's best for the county and the taxpayers is all I'm concerned with. I'll support whatever's there. If they don't want us to support their stuff, I'm sorry if we rubbed anybody the wrong way or if there's hard feelings. That's not what I'm here for. I'm not trying to make hard feelings. I'm just trying to make sure everybody's happy with the support they have. Because technology is there to work with you, not against you. Right. And ultimately, that's what it comes down to. It's working against them. It's causing hard feelings, which is then, you know, why I'm sitting here. So if whatever needs to be done to make it happen, I'll make it happen. We'll continue supporting them and providing them the same support we've been providing everybody else. I just need some assistance and on their side to help us do that. So you can still offer the IT support even if they go to the state website or for the email. Mm -hmm. Email and probably internet. The state was also trying to change it to where they wouldn't have to necessarily be on some net in order to connect in. That was the other reason. We mm -hmm. had to move off email because at the time we moved, they weren't able to allow us to connect to their email and be off of some net, which is what was slowing you guys down for your county. Right. You had a, basically a DSL connection, which anybody at home, I mean, that's slow anyway. That's what was running this entire county. We came in and put in a 15 megabit circuit to address that, but doing that, we had to move off of some of that's email. So that's why we moved over. They have since started to change that. So they are allowing other email or other internet providers to be able to connect to their system. That's the conversation I wanted to have with the state today. Because if that's the case, this is all very much a moot point. But if it's okay. not, then we have issues because now you're going to be paying another internet connection to come in here. You're going to have more monthly costs than just the $56 or whatever difference that's there. And that's the part that I'm trying to express. If I haven't done that today, I apologize. That's what I'm trying to basically warn. If that can all happen, they're fine with moving email addresses. You're fine with having one or two different email systems. I don't see a problem with any of it. Their server needs to be replaced regardless. It is dying. We've been trying to tell them that too. You know, it, it's going. It's aged. Part of it was with the case management system. That has been suspended. We removed it when we did the migration to get them back their space, but they're still a critical, you know, on the space side. And what that means is if they do any archiving, where's that backing up to? If it's on the local machine, that local machine dies, and you're just like what you did with your budget, you've lost it. If that archive's on the server, then it's backed up. So if the local machine dies, it's not a big deal. But right now, there's no server space for it. Okay, so this, this could be a, a big deal, but it's Fixable. It's all doable. Yeah, what they what they want can be done very easily. It's not as flip of a switch though. That's the one thing I will say. It is not a flip of a switch. There will be some headaches in there because what's going to happen? They're going to get new email addresses and then it's going to show up in the new address book. What happens for all those people that already have your email that's trying to connect to it? So they have your seal dot Broadwater. If they try to send it there, you're not going to get the breeze there unless there's some sort of forms that are being placed, which we can do. Okay. But there's still the chance that email could potentially not be delivered. Doesn't sound like that's any different than right now, being the potential of the state inside the state network, the email might not be delivered. But there are some of those issues that are gonna arise. And there are some limitations as of right now that the state email, because of the version of Exchange they're on, is not the same as the level that they're on with Microsoft 365. But 
again, the state's talking about possibly migrating over. There's been talk about it. I don't know what the status is. I quit checking on it. So, but there was talk. I can tell you for a fact that when we moved over your guys' 365 account, it was already on 365 for the email protection side, the spam blocking and stuff like that, which leads me to believe that they were one step away from actually having delivery being done on 365. Okay. So how that's going to impact internal, the address book and all that, I have no idea. I don't know how the state's email is set up. Okay, so what we need to do then is get some information from the state. Um, and and uh, Garrett, I wonder, I wonder if this is something, if, if you're able to work with Jeremy to give them oh, yeah. the list and, and maybe some guarantees for us. One, I think we want to keep IT with DIS. Is that okay with you guys? I'm going to let Corey speak for himself yeah. on that one. Yeah, that's okay. A, that'd be a yeah. Question for sure. Okay. Um, and and that probably has a lot to do with what the state ultimately says about things. Just because if if it's a possibility, I don't know that he'd have an issue. If, if it's not a possibility and they have to maintain our internet as well, it obviously is going to become an issue. So. But then it's not an issue either because we can still support everything on the back end. The internet's just coming into the main network. From there, the county attorney's network is completely separate. Sure. It doesn't matter what provider you use to right. get an internet connection. So, again, we're talking about a moot point, so to speak, on that because it doesn't matter. The state of Montana doesn't care. The services we provide are above and beyond what they provide because they're giving you the connection to it. But they're passing it off at their, their switch, their router. So everything back behind that, with the exception of connecting to email, is handled by the county if you're on ITSD. They do not provide help desk services. No. Where I can pick up the phone and say, hey, Microsoft Word isn't working, my computer's making a howling noise, I came in, I turned it on, nothing's happening. That's the stuff that DIS does. We also do what they do on the phone in terms of the firewall and all that on a, on a public internet connection, which is what we're doing on your guys' and the sheriff's office. So if they want to take out that part, that's that's perfectly fine. It's not an all or nothing. So either way, there's still going to be a demand for somebody to maintain those PCs. Right. Yeah. Um, and it's just more cost effective. It costs more. It's less expensive to have one IT uh, support rather than multiple. In my mind, yes. Departments. Especially if it comes time to having to try to do any type of litigation, because then you're not working amongst two or three different providers that do things two or three different ways. Okay, um, so the other question then is, um, and maybe you can fill in the blanks for me, um, we just need to, we're pretty sure about liability being fine. I would check on liability, but that's okay. going to be a Corey question as well. Okay. And possibly the liability coverage. All right. Is there anything else that um, we should be asking you to work with? Uh, Jeremy on to find answers or I'm gonna have to find answers because my main my main question is whether or not we can stay on on your guys' current CenturyLink connection because that is going to, be, to give you faster speeds I know that they just upgraded the circuit here for this the court side so it is a lot better than it was in 2014 but right now that there that would be an extra cost that is not being applied at this time because you'd be paying for a third internet connection you have two now one for the sheriffs, one for you guys. If we went, and they have to have ITSD, then that's a third connection that the county would be paying for. Even though it's here with the state, it still has to be paid for by each department that's on SummitNet. Okay, so SummitNet would be the other internet connection. That is correct. Okay. Right now the state's flipping the entire bill because all of the agencies that are on it are state departments. All justice upstairs. Yes, justice. Treasures downstairs are Merlin computers. Those are state computers. The auditor's office downstairs That's the state computers. So wherever there's a state computer They have to have an internet connection and what they did The history with some is and they started offering it to the county because they're already running in these connections And at the time they were high-speed connections But as infrastructure changed everywhere else they didn't necessarily change it currently and that's where ITSD is going back and trying to fix some of their you know, some of the slower connections. You guys were one of them. You were operating on a T1 connection downstairs. I had forgotten what problems we had had with the slow connections. Um, and that's one of the things that I think a lot of people were excited about changing. 
And since they have, again, the people that I've talked to have had no complaints on the internet. I mean, you guys have even noticed the speed difference. It's I mean, slower. I, mine seems to be slower. Which scanner is like way slower. Well, the scanner side, but I'm talking about internet, internet. I didn't really notice a difference. The, the other, the other thing was is that when we were hired in to come into play, we were all supposed to. I mean, every department was going to move to your guys' new server and your guys' new networking hardware. That changed when we came to the migration because at that time that's right when they got their guidelines and they wanted to keep everything separate. So they are actually running on older hardware across the board. The only thing we did is give them a faster internet connection to their network. And when you say older hardware, you're really just referencing the server, right? No, because no, your switches are older too. Oh, the internet switches, like so the internal switch. Your internal network yeah. is slower than the rest of the counties because of it. Because we didn't, that was all going to be moved over onto the main county network. And then that got put on hold and everything's now over on their existing hardware, servers, switches, everything. The only thing we did was gave them an uplink to the new firewall. So the internet portion is faster. I can, I can guarantee you that. The networking side is no different. It's the exact same as it always has been since 2014 that I know of. So that needs some attention. Yes. Yeah. And that's with all this conversation that came in afterwards, but by that time, I mean, I don't know if I did something to offend somebody or if it's just the fact they were done talking to me, but none of what I've asked to try to say, hey, this is what's really going on. My job as your guys as a provider to say, this is troublesome, we need to fix it, isn't getting addressed. And I guess, okay. just probably coming back to why we're here at the meeting is I, it isn't about anything, bad blood or no bad blood, whatever. It's, I, I, we want access to, to people we work with. That's why I'm here. And we understand that, and, and what our job is is to make sure that you get that so that we have you protected mm -hmm. and so that we don't do anything that's going to... And I guess a lot of this stuff, I, I assume, are correct questions because it's not like we're going to another system. We were on state system for ever and ever, and I would assume those same liabilities existed, and no one had a concern at that point, so I don't know how that would be now. It was different, though, because you had everybody under the same on the state. But, they, but I'm saying Justice Court and District Court are still, they're right. still county employees. Right, but they, the state does have contract to provide I understand, but, that side. Right, okay. But anyway, anyway, I guess that's all I'm saying is that I There's just want to be able to do my job. Right, yeah. Um, so anything else, Gary, that um, is homework for either these guys, us guys, I, I don't think so. If, they're, if they understand the change of email address, it's probably going to have to occur. It's either that or the rest of the county changes the email address. Well, that's fine. That's not a problem for us. It, <laughs> and quite frankly, if everybody changed their email address, what I told you this when we were first talking about doing the email migration, right. I said we're going to have some internal <coughs> delivery problems. And by internal delivery, that means anything inside the state email system. And that's exactly what's happened. And at that time, I advised that we should probably get new email addresses to address that. And it was, you know, no, we're, we're fine. We'll deal with the, the problem that has happened. And these guys are more impacted by it because, like they said, they deal with a lot of other agencies that the rest of the county does not. So, you know, that, that part's there. I can't, the only way to fix that is put on a new email. That's still not going to give them address to their address for unless they do move to the state email provider. Okay. So it looks like we can do that. We just have to get some more answers so that we make sure we do it right. Correct. Okay. All right. So um, do we want to meet again next week? Or should we wait until Corey's back? We uh, well, I would, I would prefer to wait until the state yeah. employees are feeling better and Corey's back. Both sure. of those. So maybe at the end of the month or early February it would be best because <coughs> I'm sure everybody yeah. is going to speak to it. Okay. That's going to be the best bet because then you probably have to bounce back and forth. You can ask the questions right over there. Okay. Excellent. Um, so probably the second week of February, that Monday, and uh, I, I didn't bring up the schedule, okay. but I'll send an email. Does that work for you, Garrett? I don't know what the second week is. It's not the 15th, it's yeah. the week before, right? Eight. 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 I could probably be on, for sure on conference call. I drove all the way from Billings this morning, so. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I don't okay. have to turn around and go back, so. Would it be easier, Garrett, if, if we conference called you? It's either way is fine with me. I don't care. I wanted to be here just so I could, you know, see, read body language, make sure I'm not coming across wrong. It's easy to do on the phone. 
And, and I think as much as, you know, you guys have what it sounds like is a desperate need, we just have to make sure we do it right. Right, sure. Um, okay. So sure. we definitely want to work with you on what it is that you need and um, make sure that we have any of the, uh, the extra questions answered. It's just all going to be on the uplink. Okay. Like I said, once you're in the internal network. But that doesn't solve, they really do need to start budgeting regardless of which direction they go for an internal network because it's always going to be separate. So our original moving all on one server is not going to work. Okay. So they're going to have to, no matter what they decide to do, you're going to have to start budgeting for hardware replacement for that. Okay. So we'll make that part of the discussion as well. Completely separate part, but it's not going to impact their email side, but it's something that needs to be addressed. And it sounds like it's impacting their speed, which impacts your ability to get stuff done too. Mm -hmm. Some of what they're facing, yes, is because of their of that. Okay. All right. Anything else on this? Okay. Wendy? I'm good. All right. Eric? Uh, here to answer questions. Franklin? No, we will wait till you throw you back and okay. you get your state people here. Okay. You got it done. All right. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you. Thank you guys. Thank you. said that she wanted access to that. We don't just provide access. We have to have approval from somebody that we know is oh. to speak of that. Okay. So, and Lisa got that taken care of this morning. Oh, then, fantastic. Yeah, Thanks, Doug. Of course. Okay. Excellent. Thanks for that. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Drive carefully home. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Doug. Uh, anything else, Franklin? No. What's the status on uh, applications for the space and uh, Debbie is downstairs. Down yep, you can go ahead and talk to her. I try to catch up to her. All right. Any any questions from the public? All right. With that, this meeting can I ask is. A yes. Are you going to announce in the paper this temporary nurse? Yes. Uh, Bobby is going to be running. What's the situation? What happening? It might be good for the community to know that. Absolutely. Yeah, we've been kind of waiting until we have that done. Um, the office was really only closed four days. The week of the 28th was a planned closure from months ago, and that was to accommodate the vacation of the, the nurses who were there. So it was really just last week, four days, because it was part-time. So um, yeah, Bobby's going to run an ad, and hopefully we'll get everything up and rolling and going shortly. So thank you. All right, any other questions, public comment? All right, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, this meeting is recess, not adjourned. <laughs> uh, we meet again at 2. What did you get your money's worth? <laughs>